Now that we've coded up pairs, let's turn our attention to lists. Here's a type for lists of natural numbers in Coq. This is an inductive type definition. Nat list is going to be a type after this definition. And nat list has two constructors. One is called nil, the other is called cons. These are traditional names for these constructors in a functional language for lists. Nil means the empty list, and cons means a list constructed, C-O-N-S, you can see that there in the word constructed, out of two other pieces of data, in this case, a natural number and another list. So the way to think about this, if you're used to singly linked lists from other languages, is that we're defining a kind of singly linked list here. And nil is the empty list, and cons is the list that has a node in which there's a single value n, and then, say, a pointer to another natural list. Okay, but that's a very mechanistic kind of implementation-oriented understanding of it. We could also think of it a little more simply, just mathematically, as this is a piece of data which represents the empty list, and this is a piece of data which represents a list constructed out of one piece of data and another list. Okay, so putting that together, here's a list that contains one, then two, then three, and then ends with the empty list. So we've got the cons of one onto another list, and that list is the cons of two onto another list, and that list is the cons of three onto the empty list nil. Now, if we had to keep writing lists this way with nil and cons, it would be pretty verbose. Just like with pairs, where it was nice to introduce some syntactic notation, it's also going to be nice to introduce some syntactic notation for lists to make our lives easier and the code more pleasant to look at. Here, we'll introduce a notation that looks a lot like lists from other functional languages, especially OCaml in this case. The notation that we introduce will use double colon for the cons operator. This is traditional. And we'll use square brackets to represent list literals. So the empty list will be written simply with square brackets. That's defined to be nil. Or if we put a double colon in, and notice that this is rendered in my Emacs as kind of squishing the two colons together, almost like four points of a square. But really, it's a prettified version of actually typing two colons from the keyboard in a row. So that's going to mean the cons of the first piece of it onto the second piece of it. And that first piece, of course, is going to be a list element. And the second piece is going to be another list. OK. The third piece of notation we'll introduce is being able to write an entire list literal inside of square brackets where we supply exactly what each of the list elements is. So that's just going to be the repeated application of cons. Uh, we take the first element from the list and cons it on, and now these little dots in here say that there could be more uh, elements in the, in the middle of it as well. But at the end, we're putting nil on. The upshot of all of that is that three, these three definitions now all mean exactly the same thing. So we could write one cons, two cons, three cons, nil. Or we could even leave out those parentheses, because in fact, up here, cons was defined to be right associative. So this is, in fact, the right associative way of putting those parentheses in. So we can just leave them out. And it actually works fairly pleasantly that way. Uh, we could instead replace nil here with uh, the empty list. That would work just fine as well, because square brackets as a, em empty square brackets mean the same thing as nil now. Or we could write the whole thing very compactly as 1 semicolon 2 semicolon 3, because that's what this notation up here gave us. OK, so anytime you see a list like this in the future, just remember, that's really saying that it's the cons of the first element onto the rest of the elements in that list. And implicitly, then, there is a cons onto nil at the very end. Let's start writing some functions on lists. The first function we'll write is going to repeat a particular natural number for some number of times. So if we repeat n a count number of times, that'll give us a list containing count copies of n. Let's define this function and talk about it. So this is a fixed point. We're defining a recursive function. It's going to call itself inside of its own body. It takes two arguments, n and count, both of which are natural numbers, and returns a nat list. How does it do that? Well, we're going to pattern match against count. So that's the count of the number of times we want to repeat n. So if we have zero times we want to repeat it, that's fine. We can return the empty list, nil. 
it would be equivalent to write uh, if empty square brackets there as well. But if count is actually one more than some other natural number count prime, then we're going to take n and cons it onto the result of what? Well, repeating n the right more number of times. In this case, it's one less time than the argument that came in because we took off that one successor constructor from the beginning of it. Okay. So now if we wanted to see an example of that, we could compute what happens if we repeat the number 42 three times, say. And that gets us three copies of the number 42. Let's write another function. This will be the length function on lists. So how do I compute the length of a list? Well, I'll do it recursively. So I've got a fixed point definition here, a recursive function. It takes in a list L. I actually, in my own code, prefer to write LST most of the time because I find that the character L inside of a source code file uh, tends to look a whole lot like the number one. Now, in this font, they're subtly different. I can tell them apart, but most of the time I like to write it like that. So I could match that list. If it's empty, if it's nil, I could return zero. So here I've written NIL and O for those constructors of those two types of lists and of nats. Of course, it would be equivalent to use the nice syntactic notations for them. I could write the empty list and the number zero. So the empty list has length zero. But if I've got the cons of some element onto another list, what am I going to do there? Well, let me first pause and say that I've named the element here H and the other list T. Those are meant to be mnemonics for the head and the tail of the list. So we're thinking of the element that's there as being the, the thing that's at the head position of it, the, the very top first position of it. And we're thinking of the rest of the elements of the list as being like a tail, like something that chains off into the distance and has all the rest of the elements. These are traditional names when pattern matching against a list. You'll see this a lot in functional code. And so since we don't need to be quite so verbose as saying H-E-A-D and T-A-I-L, I can just write H cons T here. All right, so how do I compute then the length of a list that was created with that cons constructor? Well, it's got one element in it. That's that head element there. And then I don't know how many elements are in the tail, but that's okay. I could recursively figure that out. So. I apply length to the tail to find out what the length of the tail is. It might be zero, it might be 10, it might be 100, doesn't matter. I'm going to add one onto it at the beginning there because I've got one more element, which is that head element. Okay. Now, I didn't really need to give a name to that head element anywhere, right? I didn't use it on the right hand side here, so I could have just written an underscore there. And I also could have written one plus here, if you like. Maybe that's a little clearer if you're not used to reading cock code. On the other hand, there are going to be times when you want to try to avoid using plus when it's simpler just to write successor, because it could complicate proofs potentially in the end. That would especially be true, as it turns out, if we wrote it on the right-hand side. But that's something we'll come back to in a while and, and look more closely at that. So I'm going to write it as simply as possible here and say that's really the successor of the length of t. Now I could try to compute the length of something. For example, I could compute the length of uh, repeating the number 42 three times. There we go. Its length is three exactly as it should be. For our next function, we will write append. So I've named it app here. Uh, that's short for append. What does append do? It takes two lists and kind of glues them together. So the output list is going to have all of the elements of list L1 followed by all of the elements of list L2. All right, so let's, let's see an example of that first here. Suppose I wanted to compute the append of 1, 2, 3 with 4, 5, 6. Oops, I named it app. That gets me the list containing 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 in that order. Okay, so with that in mind as how it should work, let's look at how to implement it. Once more, it's a recursive function. We match the first list that comes in, L1, with the empty list. Now, if the first list were empty, then we would just want the elements from the second list, right? If we had passed in the empty list here, we would just want four, five, six as the output, OK? So in that case, we just return list L2. But if the first list were non-empty, 
Like say it were just the list one. What should we do with that? Well, that list contains a head element and a tail. Why do I know that it has to be that way? Because if it's not the empty list, if it was not constructed with nil, then it had to be constructed with cons. And that list here, one, of course, we know from our syntactic notation is really equivalent to one cons nil like that. Okay. So we've at least got a head element there. And then there might be some other stuff in the tail, depending on the length of the first list. All right. So we've made some progress. We've deconstructed that first list. And I know that the output of append, say on the list, just one followed by four, five, six should have one at the head of it. So I'm putting one out here at the front of the list that I'm returning. And now I'm going to cons something onto it. Okay. I've computed the first value in the append of these two lists. Now I need to recursively finish that. So I call append, including all of the elements from the tail of the first list. So everything after that double colon, all right? So if I had say two, three here, then that would be the elements two and three that I'm passing in recursively at that point. It would be as if I were now trying to compute the append of two, three with four, five, six, right? But I, I had saved that one out there out front in order to glue it on at the beginning. Oops, I, let's see, I put the parentheses in the wrong place there, I guess. Ah, I wanted this one out here, right? That's the result of the recursive call there, okay? So I've got one const onto the recursive application of the append function to the tail of the first list and the second list. So what this is going to do is repeatedly peel off one element from the first list, stick it out front, peel off another, stick it out front, and so forth and so on, until it gets all the way down to one, two, three, four, five, six, and then nil, which is the list one, two, three, four, five, six. So that's the computation that append of one, two, three, four, five, six ends up doing. Now it's traditional to use a plus plus notation here for append. Uh, some other languages also use the at symbol for it, but here in Coq we use plus plus. So we're going to define a syntactic notation for append. It's just going to be the re result of applying the append function to x and y. It will also be right associative as cons was. So we could run a few unit tests here. If I append one, two, three, and four, five together, I get the list one, two, three, four, five. If I append the empty list with four or five, I just get four or five. Also, if I append the empty list on the right-hand side, it leaves the left-hand side unchanged, one, two, three. So that is our append function on lists. A couple other functions that are traditional to have on lists are the head and tail function. Uh, we've already talked about how head and tail are traditional names for the element at the beginning of the list and then the rest of the list. And we can write functions to try to return those access those two pieces of the list. Of course, we can do that with pattern matching, but here we're writing a function to do it instead. What makes this a little more challenging is, well, empty lists. What do you do if you're trying to take the head of an empty list, right? The head of the list should be the first element in it, but the empty list has no elements in it. Now, in many languages, you might raise an exception at that point. Cock does not have exceptions. So what are we going to do here? Ah. One possibility is to have the programmer pass in a default value. So the client of this function, hd, again, this is short for head, but we're leaving some characters out. It's the traditional name that we use here in Coq. The head function is going to ask the client to pass in a default value to be returned when the list is empty. This guarantees that there is no error that's possible. There's, in the case where the empty list, uh, we're trying to get the head of the empty list here, we don't have anything else we could do. I mean, I guess you, you could decide you want to turn something arbitrary here, like 42, but that's kind of uh, random. The client of the function is going to be very perplexed when they get 42 back. So instead, we ask them to pass in exactly what they want to get back in the case that the list is empty. OK, so in the case of the empty list, return the default value. In the case where there actually is a head element, go ahead and return that head element. Once more, I could clean that up. I don't really need to say t there. It was un irrelevant to the right hand side. Tail would be rather symmetric. So if I want the tail of a list, uh, in this case, I'm going to return the tail when I can. 
I could ask for a default value here. However, in the standard library of clock, return the empty list when you ask for the tail of the empty list. Let's test those. We could take the head of the list one, two, three. That gets us one. We could take the head of the empty list with a default value of zero. That gets us zero. We could take the tail of one, two, three. That gets us two, three. So we've now coded up several of the standard functions that one would find in any functional language or library for working with lists. And we've done it in Coq.